Hello, everyone. Um, this is Tom Wilcox, in case you don't know me, and uh, we're going to show you something that is very, very good for Halloween. It's about the ghosts and haunted places of the American Civil War. So we are going, let's see what's going on. I'm indebted to a lot of good sources. One of them was a book written over a century ago by a DuPont uh, her name was Margaret Dupont Lee, and she penned a book called Virginia Ghosts, and she had this immense social connection in Virginia and Delaware and Washington, D.C., and through her, she learned a lot of the old family stories, and I'm going to share one or two of them with you, so let's go. Say, so first of all, we have to deal with the thing about death in the Civil War. And really, nearly half of the Americans who lost their lives in the total span since the American Revolution was, uh, you know, in the Civil War. And uh, here's this chart here that shows you the battle deaths. Like, for instance, the wilderness was nearly 30,000 men. So uh, that was a lot of those among the dead or missing. And uh, basically, when you lump it right down, uh, the United States lost 2% of its population, uh, an estimated 675,000 men. And uh, that, in today's numbers, that would be roughly 6 million people lost. And this gives you an example of where some of the deaths came from. This is uh, someone who survived the prison of Andersonville in Georgia with a lot of U Union POWs died there. I mean, over 15,000. And uh, this man was in such poor shape that the other man had to hold him up so that they could take the picture. And they took a number of pictures because Congress launched an investigation and it actually wound up in uh, hanging a court martial and hanging major words who ran uh, the, uh, for the Confederacy. So we'll get to more of that later. And just think of how many men were missing here. This is the Civil War Trust. They said that 400,000 men were captured or missing. And basically one in four men never returned home and uh, there were a lot of reasons why the people were missing. For instance, their uh, dog tax didn't become standard military issue until 1912. So when you went into battle, um, you had to use other means so that somebody would know who you were if something happened to you. And a lot of soldiers sewed uh, or their wives sewed labels into their uniforms, giving a name and a town and a next of kin. Uh, a lot of them carried personal letters or diaries, and the last was a personal witness, because a lot of men in those days, I mean, literally whole villages, whole towns, whole counties, especially in the South, they all joined together and went into battle as one. So chances were decent that if something happened to you, somebody you knew who knew your family would know. But still, there's quite a few who are never quite made it. And this graphic is uh, the missing soldier's office. This was uh, an operation run by Clara Barton, who maybe you remember later on formed the American Red Cross. Well, uh, Clara set this office up to try to reconnect missing people with their families. And in the two years she ran it, she managed to get 22,000 people reunited, which was a splendid achievement. And don't worry about it, we're getting to the ghosts. Um, and here is our first ghost. I went, you know, don't bother with some clerk, go right to the top. And this was uh, President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, if you write to the White House and ask them if it's haunted, they will send you back some nice letter explaining that they it isn't. But uh, there have been a number of stories, and here's a few of them. Uh, 
some of the people who reported later on seeing Lincoln, and this is really peculiar, Chris, Lincoln did not die in the White House. He was so badly damaged that the, he was his his uh, wounded body was taken across the street to the Peterson house, a rooming house, and that's where he died. But his emotional center was at the White House, and that's why people see him there. And here's some of the people who saw him. Uh, First ladies, Grace Coolidge um, saw him, and... Uh, uh, one of the people who saw him was Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands, who, uh, according to a staff member of the White House who wrote a book, uh, uh, Lillian Rogers Parks reported that she actually fainted when she saw him standing there in the middle of her bedroom, which was his office during the war. So he never actually slept there. And the so-called Lincoln bedroom has actually been moved once or twice. So it gets a little confusing. Now, some of the other people saw him or uh, Margaret Truman and her friends slept the night in the Lincoln bedroom and they claimed there were a lot of strange noises that kept them awake. But it actually wasn't Lincoln or any other ghost. It actually happened to be the house. The house was in such bad shape that when her father, Harry Truman, had it checked out by the Army Corps of Engineers, they recommended uh, an immediate evacuation. And so the Truman spent most of his presidency out in Blair House across the street. And now Susan Ford, uh, she wouldn't sleep in that room because she was afraid of the ghost. Maureen Reagan actually said she did see the ghost. And uh, even some other people, President Truman saw him uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt said she had always felt his presence. And uh, it is, it, one of the people who saw him was uh, the former operations manager, uh, Tony Savoy. He said he saw Lincoln at the top of the stairs sitting in a chair. So uh, it's really strange. A lot of people seem to be aware of his presence. And this was a contemporary print of his funeral in the East Room. And uh, one of his best friends, Ward Hill Lehman, described a strange dream the president had shortly before he was shot. And this is basically the details that uh, uh, Lincoln said he was asleep and he was awakened in the middle of the night by a great multitude of people he, weeping. And according to Lehman, he said as though their hearts would break. And he made his way down stairs to the public floor and came upon the East Room filled the way you would see it in this picture. And he asked out loud, uh, who was dead in the White House? And one of the guards replied, the president, he was killed by an assassin. And he said there was a great multitude of cries and lamentations. And because of that, it woke him up. Now, it's really a great story, but um, Lehman uh, claimed he wrote the story when Lincoln said it and that he had a great memory and he got it right. But the thing is, is that over the next 20 or so years, he wrote other accounts and others of them actually differed. So I can't really tell you whether to believe it or not believe it, but uh, moving on. Now, another ghost that appeared just once was Willie Lincoln, and he was seen in the Grant administration by a White House maid, and he probably haunted it because Willie died of what is most probably typhoid fever in 1862. And his body was embalmed and laid out in the green room, which I know sounds very weird to us, but uh, it wasn't very common for people to be embalmed at home. There were no such things as what we consider to be funeral parlors. And, uh, it was very much a homegrown thing. And 
he only appeared that one time. Nobody has ever seen or heard of him since. But, you know, it, the hypothesis was that maybe he was looking for his family. And when he didn't see him, he just disappeared forever. And even Lincoln's funeral train was haunted. And this is the train that took his and Willie's body from Washington. And they went through seven different states over a period of 20 days with these huge mass funerals in which literally hundreds of thousands of people attended. And uh, according to that, uh, they said that... Uh, on the, you could actually hear the trains whistle on remote areas of the track in the dark of night, mostly in spring around April, which is when the president's body was actually transported. And here is actually a photograph of Lincoln and death on the left with the two men flanking the coffin and the bus. That is really Abraham Lincoln. It was taken by uh, a photographer when he was laid out for viewing in New York City Hall. And on the right is a, a fake picture of supposed to be Lincoln. And there's a really odd story about this picture because when uh, Secretary of War Stanton, who was heading the investigation into the Lincoln conspiracy, found out about it, he went into this extreme rage. He ordered all the glass plate negatives to be smashed and for the photographer to be arrested. And uh, the reason why we have the photograph is that General Dix, who was actually on the scene, had a paper photographic copy made and sent it to the secretary to show him how dignified it was. And, uh, it wound up in Lincoln's secretary's papers, John Hay, and eventually it wound up in the Illinois Historical Society, and it was totally lost. It was stuck there in the papers for nearly a century when a 14-year-old a, a boy managed to persuade the librarians because he was so into Lincoln they let him have access to the papers and he actually found the photograph. And here we go, that's what we have. And uh, the other picture, the Victorians had this different sense of death than we do. They, they wore much more black, they had much more elaborate funerals and everything. And so part of this whole milieu was actually uh, photographers would take these photographs and sell them on the mass market so that people could actually have some sort of a memento of this horrible, terrific event that literally almost defied their lives. And even long after death, uh, this is a picture of Mary Lincoln, and it's a fake picture, shows her in her widow's weeds, and a man named Mumler uh, actually had a ghostly ethereal Abe standing behind her with his hands on her shoulders and supposedly to comfort her. But uh, it was all a fake, but the Mumler made a lot of money out of it. Uh, in fact, he charged $7.50 a picture. And in those days, that would be heading up towards almost $200. So they were not cheap. And eventually, Mumler his uh, dirty, uh, dubious financial dealings and fake photographs caught up with them because he were, uh, was arrested in New York and put into the Tombs prison. So that was the end of that. And there's a lot of hauntings everywhere because even uh, there were 33 states in the Union, 11 states seceded, and uh, except for a few places, some of them in more border areas like New Mexico and uh, Texas, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, pretty much all the fighting was done in the American Southeast, you know, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia. Uh, so that's where most of the dead inhabit. And, uh, 
Now, here's a marker uh, of the un some of the unknowns I told you about. This actually is at Yorktown, Virginia. And it's sort of interesting because in the Civil War, they used uh, ramparts uh, that had been built for the American Revolution in the 1780s that were still there. So if you go hunting, you might possibly run into more than one ghost uh, from two different wars. And this is where some of the, uh, the dead came from. Uh, they actually were, uh, this was the Fort Delaware, Peapack Island, Delaware, in the Delaware River, and is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the state. And as you can see, it looks pretty grim here. And uh, here's some of the things that happened in Fort Delaware. They actually have tours and paranormal investigators have been there. And this is some of the things that happened. Uh, there is uh, 2,700 men died there during the course of the war. And uh, this is what happened. Uh, the show Ghost Hunters actually did a, a TV show there while they were taping. Um, the team heard what sounded like cannon fire reverberating through the tunnels. And remember, I did promise you in the uh, when you registered that there would be cannons that go boom in the night. Well, they actually did. Uh, they also captured on special film a man peeking around a corner. And one of the team was actually said he felt he was tugged uh, by a spirit. And you could also hear some chains rattling, which, of course, was not surprising since it was a prison. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff happening there. Now, here's another one of uh, where a lot of these PE people wound up. 2,400 uh, of the prisoners in Fort Delaware were actually interred across the river in the National Cemetery in Salem County, New Jersey. Now, Salem County is still a very rural part of New Jersey. And so you can imagine how it was then. So having a lot of people be buried there at the time was quite a big deal. And uh, uh, most people said they have felt uh, and seen actual perfectly round globes of light through the mist around the graves. And one of the theories of what these are is that they're actually the souls of the men who, being buried in foreign soil, want to possibly return home. And of course, another famous thing is Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And this is a, probably the most a uh, famous photo of Devil's Den. It was taken by Alexander Gardner, who worked for Matthew Brady, and he used to actually man on the scene. He was embedded, with, to use our modern term, with the Union Army and their various campaigns, and he took pictures, I mean, literally hundreds of pictures. I mean, he was literally the eyes of the war that most people saw, and... Uh, the ghost has been seen as a barefooted man, which was not surprising since shoes were a real problem for the Confederacy, for their soldiers. And uh, one of the people said he's wearing a bright shirt and floppy hat, which some people have identified as a uniform of a disorganized or militia army unit from Texas. And uh, people have actually heard him speak. He said, what you're looking for is not there. And uh, we believe that's in reference to, as you see in the picture, the, the corpse of the young man lying there. Uh, they, uh, many historians believe that that's not where he died and that he was actually, his corpse was placed there by Gardner's team to make a more dramatic statement and uh, uh, one of the reasons why a lot of people believe that is that there have been other photographs of this uh, young man in other locations. So 
the ghostly voice is being perfectly accurate. And uh, now uh, quite a few things have happened there. And one young woman had a really hair-raising experience. She was walking around with other people on top of the rocks. And uh, she actually felt a young uh, a man's hand reach and touch her ankle and he disappeared when she screamed and uh, so she describes him as a thin bearded man and some other people who have seen him actually have described him as looking like a hippie long hair long beard yes <laughs> Now, this is the Jenny Wade house at Gettysburg, and uh, uh, Jenny was what they, uh, in modern terms, call collateral damage. Uh, she's a woman who did not fight, wasn't nursing on the battlefield. She was actually baking bread, and a rifle bullet pierced through two doors of her house and claimed her life. And this picture is of her bedroom. This was uh, a motion uh, image, thermal image camera that was supposed to capture anything that moved or showed itself in the room. And you see this mist that's supposed to be somehow involved with uh, poor and fortunate Jenny. And you could actually have a ghost walk in Gettysburg. Uh, this is the 1863 Inn, and it was used as a hospital. We'll come across a few other hospitals. And they claim that four of their rooms are haunted. And uh, it's within walking distance to the battlefield. And they have uh, actually staged seances and everything. And they have a full range of equipment for guests who want to see if they can find their own ghost. And this is the Hagley Museum in Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, these are, uh, this most of the black powder that the Union Army used was manufactured right here. And you can actually go there today. Uh, uh, what still survives, if you look on this side, are the powder houses on uh, the Brandywine Cre Creek. And up above is, the, the, Hagley, the original home of the DuPont family in, in Delaware, that's still there. But and some of the buildings around here, like the old schoolhouse, are also still there. But it was a very, very, very dangerous job. And they estimate that 100 men died in explosions there between 1805 and 1860. And... Uh, one of the ghostly things is that sometimes people hear powder explosions when the powder houses simply aren't working. And if you notice, they were built with walled on three sides. So if anything happened, everything, including the men, would be blown out into the creek and thus sparing everyone on the adjacent powder houses. But... Uh, didn't always work. I mean, uh, it says here in this article from 1864, the explosion of this mill caused five other smaller uh, mills to explode and uh, 10 uh, men uh, who were uh, actually uh, all Irish, all of the, uh, some names, O'Donnell, Hennessy, uh, Deary, Hill, these are all Irish names. So basically the Irish being recent immigrants were taking this hard and dangerous job that no regular American uh, American born wanted to do. And here's something I have sort of a, a minute personal stake in, Point Lookout State Park in Scotland, Maryland, because my uh, great grand uncle was a POW there twice in 1863 and 1864-65. And uh, it was built uh, to hold uh, 
maybe two or three thousand, and it wound up having like almost ten thousand people at various points, and uh, it was really dreadful. Uh, a lot of people, something like almost four thousand men died there in a little over two years. So it's really sort of a miracle he survived. Um, although at the cost of his long-term life, because he literally dropped dead in his own barnyard in 1893 in his late 40s. And I'm sure the horrible conditions he lived through probably didn't help, but uh, that's, what, that's what happened. And as you see in the text here, that there are a lot of male and female voices. And you're wondering, female? Well, they also housed uh, Confederate sympathizers, which they were full of in Southern Maryland. Maryland was really basically very secessionist in its views, and it was really a hard time uh, keeping them in the Union, but they, they did. And uh, so one of the things people have heard is fire if they get too close to you. And it was thought to be some sort of a reference that if the prisoners acted up and tried to do a mad rush to fire upon them. And this is the USS Constellation in Baltimore, Maryland. And this was the last wooden frigate built for the US Navy before they were rendered obsolete by the ironclads. And uh, there's been a lot of sightings. So one of them is uh, a young uh, boy who is definitely too young to have been a sailor to fight. Uh, but the reason why he was there was he was known, they called them powder monkeys. And they were generally between 10 and 15 years of age. And what they would do is that they helped bring up the powder to the gunners on deck. And uh, this young man, they don't know who he was or what, but they think that... Uh, he may have been, uh, you know, killed uh, during action. And this is the Pry House in Antietam. And uh, what happened is, is that Antietam was a really bad battle. I mean, over almost 30,000 people died there. And uh, this has was used as a hospital and... Uh, they had a dormant ghost, it appeared to be a woman, and she wasn't discovered until the 1970s when there was a house fire. And um, they said the firefighters actually saw her looking out of a window before the roof of the second floor collapsed. And uh, nobody knows who she was. And this is a cute one. This is Aquia Church in Stafford, Virginia. Uh, the church is still standing. You can actually go and see it. And it says their most famous ghost is Blonde Beth. Reportedly, she was a woman who was murdered in the 1700s. But there are others. And according to uh, Marguerite uh, Lee in her book, she said that she found a reminisce from an ex-Confederate who said that he and a companion were looking for a place to shelter in a cold, moonlit night, and uh, the church apparently wasn't locked. So they went in, kept the front doors open, and went to sleep in the pews. And while they were sleeping, they were both awakened by heavy footsteps, like, and they heard someone whistling the old Scottish tune, The Camels Are Coming. And uh, when they got up to investigate, they saw through the open doors in the clear moonlit night, uh, a whole host of Union soldiers heading towards the church with the obvious intention of taking shelter there for the night. And so with the warning from their unknown friendly ghost, the men actually slipped out a black win back window and escaped. And... Uh, and here's the ghost of Lizzie Rowland in uh, Charles City County, Virginia, in Edgewood Plantation. And she was waiting for her uh, lover to come home, and he never did. And people have said they can actually see her peeking out of a window. And Miss Lee said that uh, she was most active whenever she heard hoofbeats from horses on the road. 
well, I'm afraid that doesn't happen too much anymore, but that's that's the story. And Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia, um, they're su uh, supposed to have a, a soldier uh, uh, there uh, who was one of the ones killed in the Battle of New Market. And now uh, the this was not a school as we consider it now, you know, 18 to 22. These were teenagers. These were like, 12 to like 17 and they actually voluntarily took up arms to save a uh, new market from invasion and uh, uh, supposedly that they have a statue there it's called Virginia mourning her dead and uh, it's supposed to be seen to be crying for all the young men who were lost in that battle. Now, this really gruesome picture, perfect for Halloween, is uh, former slaves cleaning up uh, after the Battle of Newmarket because the war was going at such a pace in its last years uh, that they often left the dead there for days, sometimes even months. And it was the case here. I mean, they had 13,000 dead and it was months before they could actually spare someone to go cleaning up, reburying the remains. And of course, nobody knew whose remains belonged to him. There was no DNA, no personal ID or military ID. They just did the best they could. And uh, there's also a house nearby that was a hospital called the Garth Wright House. And they have the ghost of a young girl wandering about and uh, this is another place you can see in Virginia, Fortress Monroe, and uh, the Confederacy's president, Jeff Jefferson Davis, Davis, was imprisoned after the uh, South fell, and he was captured trying to escape. Um, they believe he, he and some associate were trying to get themselves to Texas. Uh, they, you know, but they, he didn't make it. And uh, so not only is he there, so is the haunt, but his wife, Verina, is also there. She's been seen walking about the grounds, and uh, she actually stayed there voluntarily while her husband was in prison. They had her in a room directly across the prison yard where she could actually see her husband's room and the window is said to shake violently at times. And it's the only window in the place that actually does that. And here's our, some Florida ghosts, Civil War ghosts. Um, uh, one reenactor there had this really, really strange experience because they do have mock battles there. You can always look it up on their website around the time that it happened. And so people show up from all over and they don the old uniforms and get the old guns. And remember, it, it's it's to express history and, and everything. And uh, so, you know, nobody's supposed to get hurt. Uh, but, you know, this is what happened to this man. And uh, he said, that uh, one reenactor reported his experience said, I was ambushed and fate, fate stopped to death by a soldier on a horse and he fell. So he said, I shut my eyes and heard horses galloping all around me and whimpers, cries of men in pain and deep moans. And uh, a silhouette hovered above me, weeding, uh, wearing the dark gray wool of a Confederate major general said the only problem was, the reenactor said, was that I could see through his body straight into the sun. He said he was so startled that it was, I just laid there gasping at the man like a fish out of water. So that was a very memorable one for him. And of course, You've got to go to St. Augustine. It's supposed to be the most haunted city in America.
and the St. Francis Inn actually has ghosts supposed to uh, actually be heard mumbling in, in the night. And uh, now St. Augustine was one of the locations in Florida along with Key West and uh, Fort Clinch that never actually uh, left Union hands, although St. Augustine did briefly, but the Union regained it. And uh, but it was a magnet for homegrown uh, spies and saboteurs. So it's entirely logical that they could have been in that house making various plans about what to do and trying to be quiet. And here's Fort Clinch uh, in Fernandina. And uh, this is where Union soldiers were quartered uh, who were trying to interdict uh, the cattle trade uh, uh, because after Texas after, uh, was cut off from the Confederacy because the Union had, con had full control of the Mississippi right down to New Orleans. Confederacy could no longer get Texas beef to feed the army. And so Florida became vastly important and uh, they had uh, militia and my great grandfather was actually one of them. Uh, he was what they called the Florida Cattle Guard and they were actually formerly in the, ar in the army but they were led, directed by the army and they would round up the cattle and try and get them up to Jacksonville to the railhead and so the soldiers in Fort Clinch were sent out to stop it because it was nearly a thousand head a month. And that was quite a lot of cattle uh, that they had to stop. And uh, supposedly Clinch, as uh, they said, there were ghosts on the ground. Uh, visitors have reported uh, a, a union man who wanders about and occasionally tips his hat to people which is, seems a lot of fun. And uh, they also have torchlight uh, tours. So if you're ever up that way, you can definitely try that. And here we go to North Carolina, Harper House in Four Oaks. And this was another museum, that a private house that true is turned into a hospital. And uh, some people have recounted actually experiencing the sounds and smells of battle. They are shouts, rifle shots, cannon fire, gun smoke, and even burning flesh was reported. And, uh, and Four Oaks was home with the last major Confederate offensive against General Sherman's Union troops. And visitors described seeing ghosts in homes windows. And, uh, you know, it's it looks like as good a place to have haunting as any in this war. Now, this is Cedar Grove Cemetery, New Bern. They actually have this arch, uh, Bill, known as the Weeping Arch, because it's supposed to cry for all the dead who pass beneath it. And even more chillingly, it's supposed to be able to tell the future, because if you're a living person, and you pass under that gate and feel uh, the tears from the arch, it means that you too will soon die. And they're not supposed to be actual tears like you would cry. They're supposed to be drops of blood. And here's the old Charleston prison, Charleston, South Carolina. You can actually go and see it. And uh, so uh, what you can do is that, uh, this was built in 1802 and expanded in 1855. And this is what people have heard. Uh, they've heard muttering voices and doors slamming. And it was closed as a prison in 1939. So <laughs> it's just, it's no longer being used as a regular facility. And, uh, but according uh, to the Charleston Ghost Tour Circuit in Yelp, and TripAdvisor, they both recommend it highly. So if you're ever up there, please go and see that. Now, here's a really great story, also in Charleston. Um, 
the CSS Hunley was actually a state of the art, actually made before its time uh, as a submarine. And it was the first submarine ever to actually sink a ship. It actually went out into the harbor at one of the block union blockade ships, the Housatonic, and they drove a torpedo, uh, which was an explosive device. They actually speared it into the hull of the ship. And uh, you're perhaps wondering how they got out there and how they were supposed to get back. They had uh, a number of men in there who uh, actually turned this, the propellers with these handles uh, in, in unison, almost, I guess, almost like a rowing crew, everybody doing it at once. And uh, they didn't survive. Uh, the ship was actually damaged along with the Housatonic and sank. And only three of the men actually survived. So uh, this, uh, they actually found the Hunley in uh, 1999. And they spent years of conservation to finally put it on display. And in 2011, they decided to uh, reinter uh, the remains of the, uh, of the crew in a grave uh, in a Confederate cemetery with, and they did a Confederate ceremony, reenactors there in uniform, the, you know, the media was there, everything was there. And this is where the haunting happened because a woman was snapping pictures of everything and she took one picture and of a Confederate soldier adjusting the canteen strap on a reenactor and when she had the film developed, the reenactor was there, but the soldier wasn't. So that was definitely haunting. Now in Savannah and in, in Georgia, this is a former hotel that also got to be known uh, and haunted because it was also used as a hospital. And uh they actually found under the floor in the 1990s, I mean, really an entire collection of amputated limbs. Uh, so they just, you know, put the, they just dug underneath the floors and put a new floor over them when they couldn't use them. And one ghost is supposed to be a Union soldier who, uh, he's missing an arm and he roams up and down the hotel's hallway saying, has anyone seen my arm? And uh, amputees have reported that they can still feel their arm and their leg, even though it's missing. It, it's a very mysterious thing. Uh, now, of course, we are coming back around to Andersonville in Georgia and with over 15,000 deaths. I mean, this is the most, uh, uh, as far as prison compared, uh, the most people to die in a very short period of time. I'm literally talking about two years. And uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, people have heard guns firing. Uh, some uh, visitors feel extreme degrees of fear and mental devastation was reported. They've heard whimpering and yelling uh, on the site. And, you know, some people have reported a very foul and breathtaking stench. Um, and at times people have seen uh, figures walking around in the fog. And uh, so it's definitely earned its reputation as being not only the most haunted site in the state of Georgia, but probably one of the most haunted Civil War sites, period. And here's the Fort Condé Inn in Mobile, Alabama. And, uh, you know, members, have members and staff guests and staff have reported seeing her the sounds of clawing near the floor or sometimes they've actually witnessed furniture moving around on its own very very peculiar 
And this is the uh, Tennessee. Uh, this was in the Battle of Mobile Bay, and a horrible accident happened. Uh, an engineer was trying to get a gun port down to protect the ship and was trying to manage a stuck bolt. And while he was doing so, a 400 pound cannonball slammed into the side of the boat in his location. It literally uh, liquefied his body from the waist up. And a contemporary report says that uh, what his remains had to be mopped up in a bucket and thrown into the river. And uh, so that's what people have reported seeing. And uh, in the museum, uh, uh, based upon this incident and Mobile, Battle of Mobile Bay in general, uh, they see half a man wearing what appears to be the uniform of a Civil War sailor on the museum's surveillance cameras. And it's always near the mock replica of the USS Harford, which was the, the ship he served on. Now in Vicksburg, Mississippi, this is uh, the former home of John Klein, who is now, it's now a B&B. &B. And a lot of the haunting is very interesting because I mean, Klein was a very, very clever man. When he had to escape to safety before the Union Army got there, he left behind a great deal of money that was actually concealed, hiding in plain sight, like posed a purloined letter. And uh, it was actually there, uh, right in the middle of the Union headquarters, and nobody knew it. And uh, when he was able to return to his house, People have reported that if you go near the location by the fire where his favorite chair was, presumably the one with the money, uh, you can actually smell a pipe smoking there. And uh, it seems to happen mostly when the ghost is, is disapproving of someone or something. Now, the McGraven house is considered to be the most haunted house in Vicksburg. And uh, there's very little of, uh, I've been there, uh, there's very little of Vicksburg left. It was so badly damaged in the war because it was literally shelled for days on end. And uh, people, there's famous photographs of people had to leave their houses and bur uh, burrow into the hillside that was leading down to the Mississippi. And so this is one of the few that were left, and it was uh, Union headquarters. And they had a Captain McPherson who was a former resident of the town, and it was thought by the occupying Union Army that he could help facilitate things between the Union military and the Confederate population. But it didn't work that way because uh, McPherson... Uh, didn't return one night from his rounds and was declared missing and the search was made, but they never found him. But the next night, according to his CO, uh, his name was Winslow, uh, he, McPherson appeared before him and it was supposed to be looking very mutilated apparition. The ghost was dripping with bloody spectral water and uh, he told his commander that he had been murdered by Confederate sympathizers and thrown into the river. So ever since, his ghost has, has appeared. Now, this is a really interesting one uh, because uh, Myrtle's Plantation in, in St. Francisville, Louisiana, is called the most haunted house in the South. And there's supposed to be 12 ghosts on the property, including Native Americans in the burial mound. But the most famous story is that of a uh, so-called uh, slave woman who, uh, when her master was away, she wanted to ensure uh, his gratitude and that she wouldn't be sold. So she poisoned uh the family's food in hopes that they would get sick and she would nurse them back to health and 
guarantee her existence at this plantation for a long, long time. Only it went horribly awry. She supposedly overdid it, and uh, the family all died, and her fellow slaves were so terrified at the prospect of their master's retribution, they murdered her themselves and threw her body in the river. Uh, now, there's only one problem with this very colorful story, which I'm sure they're still telling on the tour. Uh, if you go there, is that it is absolutely, totally untrue. There is nothing that ever happened. You know, no trial, no incident, no missing slave, because if she were, if this was a real slave and she were missing, her master would have advertised in the papers for her recapture. And no, just as far as anyone knows, it never, ever happened. And uh, it brings up an interesting thing. There is, however, a ghost there. They call her the ghost girl. She's been seen looking out of the window, but no one has any idea who she was. But this thing about the slave uh, cook story, it does raise a very uncomfortable issue. And uh, I'd like to read this book myself. I tried to get it, but unfortunately, my library doesn't have it. Um, but Tia Miles wrote this book. It's called Tales from the Haunted South, Dark Tourism and Memories of Slavery from the Civil War Era. In it, she maintains that, uh, and this is some of her quotes, that... Uh, you know, plantation sites share stories about dead, often completely fictional, mostly African-American, the lure tourists into taking the expensive tours. And uh, she called it dark tourism. And it all often highlights the most sensational and macabre aspects of slavery, which is in the review of the book, because the realities of slavery are largely absent from these tours. Miles reveals how they continue to feed problematic Old South narratives and erase the hard truths of, of the actual Civil War era. Now, we're getting close to the end here, but many homes in the Harpers Ferry area are actually there from the uh, pre-Civil War and during the Civil War. And this is a, a very tragic story of a young boy. He was a Confederate drummer boy and uh, they were there in battle. They The drum was supposed to help the troops to rally at certain points. So these kids were out there back in my home borough of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, the first uh, person from Brooklyn ever to die in the war was a drummer boy. He wasn't shot, but he died of disease in camp, probably something like yellow fever, typhoid, a lot of stuff was happening, dysentery. And uh, so anyway, uh, it, it, the tragic story is that this kid was captured and they didn't want to send him to a prison because they they felt he would probably die and be totally disadvantaged by the larger men in getting food and things. So they sort of kept him as a mascot and they were very cruel to him. He had to polish their boots and run around and fetch and carry for them and uh, clean their guns. They, I mean, they put this kid through a trip and they kept begging them to let him go so he could go back to his mother. And they told him to be a man and they they wouldn't let him go. And one night they were drunk and they started uh, picking him up and tossing him around at each other, using him as basically something of a dodgeball. And one misdirected throw threw him out of an open window and he fell to his death. So he has been seen uh, and he's in, an, uh, in a book called The Ghost of Harpers Ferry by Stephen D. Crown, if you ever want to read it. And we have one last thing. In Memphis, Tennessee, the, uh, the ghosts of the Sultana. The Sultana was a, a steamboat bringing soldiers back up the Mississippi from the battlegrounds. The war was over. And it was. Uh, they do actually have a contemporary picture of the boat before it left. And I mean, 
there was just like thousands of men. The boat was terribly overloaded. And that's what probably caused the uh, disaster because the engines were pumping so hard, the boilers to try and keep up and carry all that weight that uh, they just simply... Ex um, one of the stories is, is that uh, in the 1880s, a man named Brown was actually arrested and put on trial for destroying the Sultana because he was... Uh, a known saboteur, uh, they called them boat burners, and uh, he he took credit. He said he destroyed it. Uh, even uh, there was a PBS program about ten years ago called History Detectives, where a team of an archaeologist, a historian, and several other people would actually investigate these stories, and they did a whole program on the Sultana. And if you Google history detectives and the Sultana, you'll probably find the program. It is on the internet because I've seen it. Uh, but uh, people have seen strange lights out on the river, supposed to be the, the ship burning. They've heard screams and choking and other sounds because, I mean, you either died by the fire from the boilers exploding or you drowned. So uh, other apparitions have been seen in the fields surrounding the river just after daybreak. And they before they disappear, they're usually in a dense fog. And uh, they are actually walking around where the same location, the Sultana, was destroyed. So that is our very, very ghostly tour of the American Civil War, and we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please direct them to a dead Bussinger at the library, and she will forward them to me. And I hope you enjoyed it very much. Thank you.